William's arrival in the world could not have come at a better moment. Britain was in triumphant mood. The Falklands War, which had brought people together in a way not seen since the Second World War, was over. An end to hostilities was formally declared the day before his birth. Victory restored national pride, and brought huge relief, not least for the royal family, on a personal as well as professional level. Prince Andrew's life had been on the line along with all the other servicemen and women. He was a Royal Navy helicopter pilot with the aircraft carrier Invincible and, like everyone with a son or brother in the war, they had lived in fear of bad news. His scalp would have been a fantastic propaganda coup for the Argentinians. The cabinet had wanted him to be moved to a desk job for the duration of the war, but Andrew had insisted on being allowed to do the job he was trained for and the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh supported him. So when the task force had set sail from Portsmouth on the 5th of April, leaving emotional scenes on the quayside, Prince Andrew had been amongst them. The Prince of Wales became preoccupied by what was happening on the other side of the world, partly as heir to the throne, partly because he was colonel-in-chief of two of the regiments, and not least of all because he worried about his younger brother. Yet Diana was so deeply turned in on herself by then that she couldn't share his anxiety and seemed to positively resent his focus being on the Falklands instead of her. Before the war, few people in Britain had even heard of the Falkland Islands. They were 8,000 miles away in the South Atlantic, barren, windswept, and largely populated by sheep but they had been British for 150 years, and when Argentina, which had long disputed their ownership, took them by force in April 1982, Margaret Thatcher, then Prime Minister, took the country to war to reclaim them. It was the first time that modern communications and television had brought the shocking reality of war into people's living rooms. Throughout the remains of the summer the ships made their way home to Portsmouth, each one returning to a hero's welcome and photographs and snippets of news about the new royal baby did nothing but enhance the country's temporary sense of well-being. A week after the birth, the baby's names were announced. He was to be William Arthur Philip Lewis, with William never to be abbreviated, according to Buckingham Palace, to Will, Willie or Bill. See how long that lasted. The choice of William was, as his father explained, because it is not a name that now exists in the immediate family. The last Prince William, Charles's cousin, Prince William of Gloucester, a keen pilot, had been killed ten years earlier in a plane crash. He was just 30. His namesake was christened on the 4th of August, the Queen Mother's 82nd birthday, in the music room at Buckingham Palace, dressed in the lace christening gown that had first been worn by Victoria's second child, the future Edward VII. Dr. Robert Runcie, then Archbishop of Canterbury, conducted the service using the lily font and water from the River Jordan in the Holy Land, which was a custom dating back to the Crusades. The ceremony began at noon, followed by a champagne lunch in the state dining room for the family and 60 guests, including George Pinker and the nurses who had attended William's birth. The cake, again in keeping with tradition, was the top layer from Charles and Diana's wedding. Despite being swaddled in oceans of antique lace for his baptism, and having such a distinguished roll call of grandparents, godparents, friends and relations, William's early years were remarkably normal and informal. For all its history and grandeur, Kensington Palace was a comfortable family home. George III had converted it into apartments for the royal family and grace and favor apartments for the royal household. Diana's elder sister, Jane, had married Robert Fellows, who was then assistant private secretary to the Queen, so they were neighbors. Their first child, Laura, was a year old when Charles and Diana moved in. Princess Margaret was another neighbor, and initially a staunch supporter of Diana. Prince and Princess Michael of Kent, whose children were slightly older than William, had an apartment in the palace, as did the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester with their three children. Numbers 8 and 9 were entirely refurbished and redecorated before Charles and Diana moved in, and although a uniformed butler would open the door to visitors, inside it was like any smart, privately owned townhouse. It was not large by royal standards. It had three reception rooms, one housing a grand piano, a dining room, three bedrooms, including a master suite, 
and on the top floor a nursery suite plus rooms for the staff. The decor was the work of Dudley Poplack, a South African designer Diana's mother had recommended and who had known Diana since she was a child. He ensured that the furnishings were elegant but cozy, a comfortable mixture of antique and modern, with pretty fabrics and wallpapers. The hall and stairway were carpeted in fresh lime green and pink with a Prince of Wales feather design running through it. After the first few weeks, Anne Wallace, whose speciality was newborn babies, was replaced by Barbara Barnes. Aged 42, she had spent the previous 15 years working for Princess Margaret's friends, the Honorable Colin and Lady Anne Tennant. She was not a formally trained nanny, didn't wear a uniform, liked the children she looked after to call her by her first name and had a good sense of humor. Her style was exactly what Diana wanted and reinforced the sense of normality that she insisted would be the hallmark of William's childhood. She didn't want him to be seen and not heard, or banished to the nursery, and she certainly didn't want anyone thinking they might take her place as his mother. But Diana didn't know how to be a mother. She adored William and Harry when he came along two years later. There is no doubting her all-consuming passion for them both and the love she showered on them, but she had never been successfully mothered herself and therefore had a skewed view of motherhood. She continued to suffer bouts of depression compounded by postnatal depression, and self-loathing from which the only release was to cut herself, to the alarm of all those around. At times, Barbara Barnes must have wondered who needed more looking after, mother or baby. As Diana said herself of that time, boy, was I troubled. If he didn't come home when he said he was coming home I thought something dreadful had happened to him. Tears, panic, all the rest of it. Always in the back of her mind were the feelings of loss and abandonment she had experienced as a six-year-old and the fear that it would happen again. Her mind became a cauldron of jealousy. She imagined Charles with Camilla Parker Bowles, whom she knew he had loved and was afraid he still did love. He was crass in his handling of the situation. Unable to put himself inside the head of an insecure 20-year-old, he kept a photograph of Camilla in his diary, which, inevitably, fell out in front of Diana, and he wore gold cufflinks on his honeymoon that had been a gift from Camilla. Got it in one, she said. Knew exactly. Camilla gave you those, didn't she? He said, yes, so what's wrong? They're a present from a friend. And, boy did we have a row. Jealousy, total jealousy. The rows were tumultuous and terrifying but they were only half the story. There were good times too, which were precious. When she was feeling happy and confident, Diana was pure delight. She was funny, carefree and impish and there were days when the house resounded with laughter. Friends remember going to lunches when she and Charles would giggle and joke throughout. Others remember arriving to go to the theater with them one evening and Diana saying to Charles, Come on, let's go and say goodnight to the children. I'll race you to the top of the stairs. The pair of them then ran up the stairs and collapsed at the top in a heap of laughter. K.P., as Kensington Palace was known, was not the grandest house that the heir to the throne might have lived in, but the idea was that it would be a London bolt hole. The master plan was that they would base themselves at Highgrove, the country house Charles had bought near the Cotswold town of Tetbury in Gloucestershire in 1980. He was never happier than in the country and although the house had one or two security drawbacks, like a public footpath running through the garden, and was neither very large nor architecturally imposing, Charles fell in love with it and it has remained one of the greatest pleasures in his life. And while he set about creating a garden, he gave Diana a free rein to do up the inside of the house, for which she once again turned to Dudley Poplack. Although not palatial, Highgrove did have four good reception rooms, nine bedrooms, six bathrooms, a nursery wing and staff accommodation. While outside there was a big stable block with room for ten horses, a lodge, a farm manager's house, a couple of farm cottages, farm buildings and a dairy. But what he really fell in love with were the trees and the parkland surrounding the house, which he felt had a particularly English feel, and he developed an instant passion for a 200-year-old cedar tree, just feet from the west side of the house. The garden swiftly became Charles's passion. He sought the help of a family friend, Lady Salisbury, 
known as Molly to her friends, mother of the seventh Marquess, who designed, amongst others, her own garden at Hatfield House in Hertfordshire. She was a legendary plant expert and garden wizard, and was much amused some years later that, having gardened without the use of chemicals since 1948 and been written off as a crank, she was suddenly fashionable. She taught the prince almost all he knows about landscaping and horticulture and as they dug, plotted, measured and planted side by side, many of her ideas rubbed off on her eager student. But there was another influence on Charles in his conversion to organics, Miriam Rothschild, a scion of the famous banking family, whose passion for bugs, butterflies and wild flowers was second to none. The influence on the prince of both women was profound. The sadness was that while Charles became ever more immersed in his creation, of which in the early days Diana kept a photographic record, Highgrove soon lost its charm for her and she increasingly chose to stay away, preferring to be in London. Mm -hmm.